morning. You know, in life, God is always, always, always teaching us if you're paying attention. And let me tell you the good news about God, and that's this. God will never fail you. When you mess up and you blow, he doesn't fail you. He's not in heaven with a big fat head. But he always gives retakes. And so I would encourage you to look around and learn the lessons that God's trying to teach you so that he doesn't have to keep giving you retakes. You, you with me? Now, let me tell you something. Do you know somebody who keeps doing the same thing over and over and, and, you, and you think... I've talked to them, I've told them, and they keep doing the same thing, right? And you think, are they ever going to figure this out? I think there's times that God is saying to us, hey, I want to teach you. And today we're going to talk about this idea of praying in faith. And I don't know about you, but I really want to be a man who really can pray in faith. Somebody who really walks with God so much that everywhere I go, I'm praying in faith, that I'm, that I'm trusting God Every moment of every day. Wouldn't you like to be that person? Uh, now, I don't know about you. I, how many of you have ever seen the movie Heaven Almighty, which is the second one? Uh, with, uh, or is that the first one? No, it's the first one. Anyway, Bruce Almighty, I think, is the first one. But anyway, where for just a little while, he for, for a block, he's able to be God. For a block, you know, for his area. What if every thought you had happened? What if when you were driving... You were able to, whatever went through your head, somebody was tailgating you, and whatever you went through your head, you were able to make happen. How many people today would be dead because of you, right? Right? Or when you're in a hurry, you could get there. Or when you needed something, you could instantly just ask for it and get it. The problem that so many of us have when we talk about prayer is that most of the time when we think about prayer, we think about prayer selfishly. God, what can you give me? God, what can you fix for me? God, how can you do that? Instead of saying, like Jesus said, your will be done. Now, I'm going to tell you kind of the crux of the message today. And then if you need to nap, you can take a nap. And then just wake up near the end. And, you know, if somebody quizzes you on the sermon, you'll at least know what it was. My mom, sometimes we'd get home from church and I'd fall asleep in church. And to get home, my mom would say to me, so what was the sermon about? My brother and I figured it out. It was about Jesus. <laughs> Pretty much worked every time. So. Now, let me tell you the theme. The most powerful prayers in the Bible have one central theme every single time. From the Old Testament with Abraham all the way to the New Testament when you're even talking about the apostles and the disciples. When you're talking about the blind man that comes to Jesus and the lame man that come. And, and anybody who needs healing, anytime that there's a prayer, here's the biggest part of it. You ready for this? The biggest part of prayer, if you want to pray a prayer of faith, is to recognize or to cry out with these words, God, I need you. I need you. When we think about prayer so often, we just tell God stuff and we're just telling him, listen, prayer is not supposed to be just one-way communication. It's also to allow God to speak to your heart. So that as you pray, you say, God, I need you. And then he reminds you and reminds me of the things that we need to do in order to do what he wants us to do. Now the good news about being a powerful person of prayer is this. It's not about you. If you're starting to think, I'm a prayer warrior. Because somebody one day told you you were a prayer warrior. Or somehow you were awesome in prayer. As soon as you start to get prideful, you no longer have power. Because you've forgotten where the real power comes from. It is not from you. It's not how spiritual you are. It's not how much you think you have your act together. It's not about the words that you use. You know, maybe you learn to pray with the blood of Jesus over everyone around you. And the Spirit and I bind every... And you've learned all these fancy words that aren't in the Bible. And somehow it makes you feel more spiritual. That is not what makes a prayer of faith. Nothing wrong with words. But it's the heart behind them. Are you really dependent on God? So let's look at three things today. What do I need to do... To pray powerful, powerful prayers. Boy, that's a tongue twister. What do I need to do to pray powerful prayers? I did it at that time. All right. Uh, what do I need to do to pray powerful prayers? Number one, you need his presence. John chapter 14 says this. All this I have spoken while still with you. 
But the advocate, and I talked about this a few weeks ago, the advocate, talking about the Holy Spirit, that word is paraclete, which many people translate as attorney or lawyer. But literally, it means somebody who stands alongside of you. I'm going to get back to that in a minute, so hang on to that thought. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. Now the first thing I want you to notice in here is when it talks about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is given, not gotten. So it, it's not the idea that you went and did something to earn the Holy Spirit in your life. To earn God's power in your life. Receiving the Holy Spirit is all about submission to God. Going, God, I need you. And when you become a Christian, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the one who comes along beside you, is, is part of your life as soon as you give your life to Christ. So what does that mean? It means that he'll remind us of what Jesus said. One of the reasons it's so important to read Scripture one of the reasons it's so important to have a quiet time, to spend time in the morning or in the evening or lunch, spend time reading your Bible and allowing God to, to fill your life with his word is because it's amazing how as you go through life, God will remind you of what he said. So often we pray and we think, and, and you've met, I want you to think of somebody that you think of as spiritual. And you, when you think of them as spiritual, you think that they're sitting in their prayer closet or they're walking down the street and all of a sudden they hear, build an ark. Right? You, you think that God just says, go tell that person this. Right? That somehow in their head that all of a sudden this, this you know, God's voice comes from heaven and tells them, listen, 99.937% of the time. The way that the Holy Spirit, the way that God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit is reminding us of the things that Jesus said. How many of you think you'd be better off if you lived your life according to the Bible? How many of you think you would have done a little better in college if you had lived your... Okay, we're not going to do that one. All right. Now, here's the other thing that happens. One of the problems that happens in life, one of the times that we struggle with fear, because Jesus here says... Peace I leave with you. And one of the reasons that we struggle with peace is because we're afraid of being alone. One of the things that you and I need to recognize is that the Holy Spirit has come so that we are never alone. There may be times that you feel alone. There may be times that you feel lonely. There may be times that your emotions tell you you're lonely. But the truth is, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, the Bible says that you are never alone. Alone, You have his presence. When's the last time that you just took a minute to acknowledge God's presence in your life? To take a minute as you're sitting in church right here and say, God, thank you that you're present with me. Thank you that you're speaking to my heart. When you're driving, God, would you help me to recognize that you're with me always and you can help me not to get so frustrated with that tailgater behind me or that person who thought that the speed limit was 15 and a 45, right? Right there on when you're taking the kids to school. It's always when you're in a hurry. It's never when you're not in a hurry. That person, I sometimes think it's angels sent from God. I, I really think there's times in heaven that God's in heaven and he goes, you know, Eric's really driving a little too quick. Gabriel, would you send one of your best uh, with a, oh, I don't know, an Impala uh, in uh, 1973 and put him, you know, make sure the muffler leaks a lot and uh, uh, put, put a couple of stickers on there like peace for all or world peace on the back and a couple of hippie symbols. And I want you, as soon as you see Eric coming, I want you to have that angel run that stop sign in a hurry and then slow down. Do you have a pet peeve like that when you're driving? You're driving and all of a sudden you're in a hurry and you see a person run a stop sign and they were because they were in a hurry, but then they realize, you know, I'm no longer in a hurry. I'm now in front of Eric. And, right? And there's something inside of us because we're human that says, you did that on purpose, right? Isn't that how we are when we're driving? We think, you did that on purpose. Well, here's the deal. Listen, here's the deal about the Holy Spirit. You're never alone and God cares about those little things details of your life and can I can I tell you this it's a test 
God is growing you if you and I will pay attention, whether it's through driving or spilling coffee or having a rough morning or getting behind. Are we going to learn the lessons and be able to stand in God's presence regardless of the circumstances? You know what most people's most frustrating thing of the week happening was? You ready for this? This is how Americanized we are. Their internet went down. Ooh, I mean, that's the society we're in. And it frustrates me to death. Oh, no. Because the way we live, we, we've gotten so spoiled that we don't take time to go, God, thank you for your presence, even in the middle of this. Philippians 4, 7 says this, that he'll give us peace beyond understanding. Why? That will guard our hearts and our minds. How do you do when you're walking in peace? What would it look like if you drove in peace? What would it look like if you disciplined your children in peace? What would it look like if you treated your spouse with love and peace? What would it look like if you treated that coworker? If you really could walk in peace, no matter what they said, no matter what they did, but you allowed the peace of God through the Holy Spirit to guard your heart and guard your mind so that their difficulty didn't take away your peace. How would that change your life? We need to recognize that we need God's presence. It's trusting in Him. Hebrews 4 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest... Who's ascended into heaven. That means you don't need another high priest. You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to come to me and go, Eric, I need to confess my sins today. And I tell you to say four Hail Eric's and leave, you know. Um, the, the Jesus is our high priest. And that's what it says here. We have a great high priest who's ascended into heaven. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. And two verses later, let us then approach God's throne. Listen to this. Of grace. With confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There is a huge idea in this passage. They were dealing with the Romans. The early Jews were dealing with Romans. And you would have to come before a judge or a magistrate. And you would go on trial. And when you came before a judge, he used a gavel. He was sitting on a throne. Or even the king would be sitting on a throne of judgment. And the king was going to decide your fate. This verse is radical. Now, we don't have kings today, but think about this. It says God sits on a throne of grace. One of the reasons that so many Christians are so mean to each other, one of the reasons that so, so many Christians are so judgmental and think that they've got a rule book and they've got their little list and they're going to go around and they're going to help everybody else with their list and they're traveling with a gavel everywhere they go and they judge everybody they meet. And one of the reasons people don't like Christians is because they don't realize that Jesus, because of Jesus, God put his gavel away. And he's now on a throne of grace. Where he says, you don't deserve my love, you don't deserve my compassion, you don't even deserve to be able to pray to me. But I've given you grace. So not only can you pray, you can come before God's presence with boldness. Not a boldness that's disrespectful, not a boldness that says, God, you don't matter. But a boldness that says, God, I can't believe that I'm allowed to have a relationship with you. God, I can't believe that I can have your presence at any time, at any place, no matter what I've done, no matter how bad I feel. Listen, if you were on the way to the church this morning and you cussed out three drivers, ran over two squirrels on purpose, and hit a couple of mailboxes, right now you can say, God, thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love. I'll be replacing those mailboxes after church. <laughs> and I thank you that I can come into your presence. That's how awesome God is. That even when you and I fail, we can come into his presence. The reason that you and I, this is your first challenge for today. The reason that you and I need to spend time daily with God and spend time in a quiet time is not so we can check it off a list and say, I read my Bible. It's so that you can, in the quiet place, sense God's presence, hear his voice, so that when you're in the nasty now and now, when you're, when you're in the busy world, when somebody's tailgating you, when that coworker doesn't act the way you want them to act, right, because you're going to somehow fix them. That you can say, God, I have your presence. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. His peace is with you. It guards your heart and guards your mind. Wouldn't you like that? So let's spend time with him. Let's be aware of his presence. Waiting on God in faith. Hurry, worry, and selfishness 
demonstrate we are not walking in faith. This is, by the way, this next sentence is huge. One of the signs of sin is we're always looking for shortcuts to satisfaction or success. Faith is always about waiting on God's timing and trusting Him in the meantime. If you're praying and you expect God to answer your prayers just the way you want Him to answer them, and just immediately the way you want Him to answer, you have not learned much yet. As you read Scripture, you see sometimes that, that people cry. Listen, Jesus cried out to God, God, I don't want to go to the cross. If anybody's prayer would be answered, I would think it would be Jesus. Jesus, God, I don't want to go to the cross. And yet He knew, but God, Your will be done. If that's what you want, I'm willing to go to the cross. Sometimes when you pray, you pray, God, I'd love you to fix this situation. I'd love you to heal this. I'd love you to take care of this. I'd love you to take care of this person. I'd love you to fix this. But God, even if you don't, I'm going to trust you. Sin is always looking for a shortcut. A shortcut to be happy. A shortcut to be fulfilled. A shortcut to say, you know, I don't have to do this. It started in the Old Testament. Listen, the brothers, the one brother, Shane, uh, 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 Jacob and Esau, he traded, he was hungry. So he traded his birthright for a bowl of soup. And if you look back all through history, from that day on, Jacob is mentioned and his brother is not mentioned anymore. He took a shortcut. When you're expecting God to give you all happiness and all joy and in relationship, you just expect it to go easy. That's not life. We need His presence to walk through it. Number two, we need belief and forgiveness. So not only do we need His presence, we need belief and forgiveness. Did you know every miracle that happens in your life and every miracle in the Bible was based on belief? But not belief in yourself. And when a prophet would come, the prophet would always remind whoever it was that it wasn't about the prophet. It wasn't about the person who was doing the healing. It was about God and His power. Years ago, I remember uh, there was a, a, a good friend of mine. He was my mentor. He passed away a few years ago. But he told me a story about Peter Lord years ago. And I don't remember the exact story, but I'm going to do the best to tell it the way I heard it. Um, Peter Lord was a prankster when he was young. Now, if you haven't met Peter Lord, Peter Lord's about 140 years old now. And, um, and Peter Lord is still hilarious if you listen to him. But he's, but he's slowed down a lot. Now he talks like this. Um, years ago he talked like this. Hey, come on, we got to get going. And uh, but now he's more like this. And uh, but but he was also a practical joker, especially with the staff. And I can't remember which staff member was next door, but one day he figured out a way. I don't know if he did it through the wall or whatever, but he figured out a way where the guy had his lamp plugged in to put a switch on there, so he could turn the guy's lamp off and on at will. And so one day, I don't know if the guy was talking on the phone or talking to somebody, he could hear him next door, and every time he would say a certain word, he would flick the light on or off. So let's say the word was amen. So the guy would be talking, yeah, 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 blah, 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 and amen. Click, and he clicked the light off. Did you see that? Yeah, what happened? I don't know, I just said amen. Click, back on. That was really weird. It's like he it knew I was going to say the word amen. Click. It's like clap on, clap on. And he kept doing it. And the guy kept trying to figure out what was going on. He was flicking the light off and on. And the guy thought somehow it had to do with his words. That if he kept saying, I don't remember if it was amen or what it was. But as he said certain things, that whatever he said was clicking it on and off. What he didn't realize is actually Peter Lord next door going. <laughs> you know, too many of us think that somehow prayer is about our power. Or belief in ourselves, or somehow if we get certain things right. Listen, there's a, there is there are verses that talk about holiness and righteousness, but the truth is, all of that comes from God. I'll get there in a minute. But listen to this. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter eleven. Have faith in what's the next word? God. Jesus answered, "Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them." Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it'll be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so your Father in heaven may forgive your sin. Now, 
Most of the time when you hear this teaching, especially from television preachers, hello brother, today I want to talk about the prayer of faith. If you just pray the what you want and you ask God, God I'm going to send in a, and of course you need to send my ministry money, you need to send me a seed. And if you send me a seed of $35, $47, $147, you know it's got to be multiples of 47. By the way, that's witchcraft, I just, because witchcraft is always a requirement of specific things, but that's, I'm not going into that right now. Harry Potter's the one that has incantations specific prayers you have to pray. God doesn't do that, but okay, well, there's like, I'm preaching now. All right, so, so you know, they're on TV. Hey, if you send in the seed uh, to my ministry, of course, and I just bought myself a new Lexus and a new Jaguar and a new uh, Rolls Royce and a jet, I got to get this jet because, you know, I got to be able to get out around the country to, to get more money. And, uh, and, and, but if you pray these prayers, you know, you can throw a mountain into the sea. What they realize, listen, the very beginning of this verse starts with this idea, have Faith in God, not in a person. Listen, I, I, I'm glad you love me. I love you too. But I'm not God. And, and I want you to check everything I say against God's word and against God's power. And never put a person above what God says in his word. Never. Never. We're not God. Have faith in God. And then at the end, after it talks about prayers, it says... Forgive. Forgive anyone. If you hold something against somebody, forgive them. I don't know about you, but one of the hardest things in life is to forgive people the way God forgave us. Now, you ever, you ever do a 90% forgive? Like, I forgive that person, but, but boy, if I could say to them what I really want to say. You know, I forgive that person, but boy, it'd be great if something bad happened to them, Right? I forgive that person, but boy, they're going to get it one day. Right? That's not real forgiveness. Here's the thing. We need to begin to pray, God, would you help me to forgive the way you forgive? God, would you help me to live a life of forgiveness? Boy, wouldn't that be an awesome prayer to really be answered in your life? Do you know how many people's lives would be changed if they would learn how to forgive the way God forgives? Now, that doesn't mean, listen, don't take this wrong. That does not mean to be a doormat. There were times that Jesus walked away from a crowd that wanted to kill him. There were times that Paul called on the Roman government to protect him. It doesn't mean to be a doormat and just say, well, whatever will be, will be. It doesn't mean to take abuse. But forgiveness means I can love you and, and I can forgive you. I may not want to deal with you anymore. I may not be able to handle, I may need boundaries to keep me away from your evilness. <laughs> but I can forgive you. Can we walk in that forgiveness so that when we pray, our prayers will be answered. answered. Hebrews 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. We need that belief. We need forgiveness. We need to ask forgiveness and give forgiveness. But we need that belief, not in ourselves, but in God. When's the last time you went outside and just looked up at the stars? Yesterday morning, I drove by Kennedy Park. I had to take Jenna to attract me. And so I was getting ready to head home. It was still dark out. The sun wasn't up yet. And I thought, I'm just going to run by there and sit on the water for a few minutes. I wasn't the only one that had that idea. There were a few people sitting there. Some guys going out, getting ready to go out in their boats. And I just looked and I said, this is so awesome. The way that God creates when I, when I look around and see the perfection and the order of the universe, I don't think that just sprang out of nothing. All of a sudden, chaos became order because it wanted to. I believe there's a God who created. And we have to take time sometimes just to back away and go, God, thank you. You know, one of the reasons sometimes that we don't feel powerful in our prayers is because we haven't taken time to really acknowledge who we believe in. And how awesome he is. Do you realize the God of the universe that created everything seen and unseen. Today as those planes are flying over. The physics that allow planes to fly. When it doesn't make sense. When we look at it we're like that doesn't really make sense. Well, but Eric it has to do with lift and the way the air goes over the wings. And blah blah blah. Okay. But when you look at that to say God you're so awesome. The way that you created the universe. The things that you create, the things that we see around us, and to remind ourselves that we have a creator. In Philippians 4.13, one of the best verses for belief is this. Philippians 4.13, 
I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me, right? It says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Now, that doesn't mean I'm just going to pray selfish prayers. God, you give me what I want. And do what I want you to do. And God, if I pray that I'm healthy, wealthy, and wise, you know, the Ben Franklin prayer, right? It, God, if I pray that, then I'll just get whatever I want, whatever I want. That's not biblical. But I know I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. So God, I can forgive somebody who doesn't deserve forgiveness because you're the one that strengthens me. God, I can love that person at work that's unlovable because you're the one that strengthens me. God, I can become a patient driver, a patient parent, a patient spouse, a loving person, a more caring person, a less selfish person. Somebody who shows your love everywhere they go because you strengthen me, not because of me, but because of him. Finally, number three. Not only do we need His presence, not only do we need belief and forgiveness, but we need confession. Now, typically when we think of confession, you and I think of sin. We think of confession, we think of saying to God, God, here's my list of things I messed up in. I'm going to tell you them. But confession is not just telling God how you're wrong, but it's telling Him that you need Him. It's reminding yourself that you're not God. Now, Oprah believes that we're gods. Did you know that? Yes. But I want to tell you something. You're not God. Isn't that good news? Yes. Isn't that good news? You're not God. And then here's the even better news. I'm not God either. So I want you to take a moment. First of all, I want you to say out loud, I'm not God. Yes. Now I want you to tell the person next to you that they're not God. Go ahead. Take a moment and do that. Both sides. Yes. Anybody in here glad that they're not in charge of the universe? Yeah, okay. Right? You're not in charge of the universe. Why do you keep trying? <laughs> Worry is all about trying to be in charge of the universe and control. When you get angry at a person, typically, listen, typically anger comes out of wanting to control somebody. When I'm driving and somebody tailgates me, I, now I, it may be defense, like I'm going to die, which they say is pretty natural to have a, but, but anger many times out of wanting to control somebody. We're wanting to get our way and we don't get our way, so we become angry and upset. When we talk about confession, I want to encourage you. Remind yourself that you're not God. When you find yourself trying to control the world and you find yourself trying to worry, repeat these words. You may have to get in a mirror and go, I'm not God. I don't have to control the world. And then remember, God, you're God. Shocker, huh? You control the universe. God, if you wanted to, you could take all this sickness away from me. God, if you wanted to, you could give me a billion dollars tomorrow, and I know that would solve all my problems. By the way, that's how we think, right? God, you can do what you want to do, but I know that you're working all things together for my good, so I trust you. I trust you. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. I'll be doing that today. I'm going up to the hospital to visit somebody. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. That's one of the reasons it's good to be in a small group. We don't stand up in the middle of church and go, I'm going to tell you my 25 sins of the day. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for each other so you may be healed. Finally, listen to this last sentence. This is huge. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, I want you to hang on to that last sentence. We're almost done. I want you to think of somebody who you think is a powerful pray, person praying because they're a righteous person. I want you to think of that righteous person. And I want you to think, boy, I wish I could have them pray for me. That righteous person, I want them to pray for me. Now, I want to tell you something to really freak you out. You ready to be freaked out? If you're a believer, the Bible says that God, through Jesus Christ, has given you His righteousness. He's given you His righteousness. So that righteous person that you just thought of is just as righteous as you are. Oh, but Eric, you don't understand. I'm messed up. They are messed up too. They're just better at hiding it than you are. He pours His righteousness in our heart. And so you could read this verse this way. The prayer of Eric Brookins is powerful and effective. The prayer of Al, that's hard to believe, is powerful and effective. 
The prayer of Brian is powerful and effective. The prayer, I have to add a woman, of Suzanne, didn't want to be sexist, is proud, powerful and effective. Your prayers are powerful and effective, not because you're righteous, not because you're smart enough, but when you recognize the power doesn't come from you, it's not because I'm good enough, I don't control the switch, I don't control the universe. This is the lesson God's trying to teach all of us, that we're not in charge. God, the reason my prayers work is not because of me, it's because of you. And the more humble you are, and the more dependent you are on God, and the more you do what I said at the beginning of the message, the more that you and I say, God, I need you. God, I want to pray the way you want me to pray. God, I'd love you to heal this person that I care about, but God, your will be done. God, I'd love you to fix this situation in my life that's so difficult, but your will be done. Maybe you're going to teach me something through this. God, I don't want to go through this trial. I would like life to be easy and just wake up in the morning and bluebirds and the, everybody sings and the car never breaks down and the computer works all the time and everybody I run into goes, hey, I love you. You're awesome. And I go, you're awesome too. And we just go, go through life like the Lego movie, right? Everything is awesome. God, I wish it was all that way, but when it's not. I trust you. God, thank you that you've given me your righteousness. Thank you that you've given me your love. Thank you that you're the creator of the universe. Remember his presence. Remember who you believe in, how awesome he is. Remember to forgive other people and finally confess that you're not God and he is. And then when you pray, your prayers will be powerful and effective. God, would you change my heart? God, would you help me through this trial to have the right attitude? God, would you give me your peace in the middle of this huge storm that I'm going through? And he will do it. He promises that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake you. No matter how alone you feel today, you're never alone. Jesus is with you. He'll give you wisdom. He didn't say he would make life easy. He actually said, in this world, you will have trouble. Yes. But he's overcome the world. So my prayer for you is that you would know his presence. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step to having his presence all the time is to surrender your life to him. He says that when you do that, you receive the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're never alone again. God himself. Jesus intercedes on your behalf. The Holy Spirit speaks words that you and I don't even know sometimes. We don't even know how to pray. But God will never fail you. Just reach out to Him and say, I need you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that. We're going to have our offering in a minute. Maybe you're here today and the truth is, you haven't been praying. So maybe it's time to start praying. Everywhere you go and everything you do to begin to walk in an attitude of prayer, knowing that your prayers are righteous, powerful, and effective. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. I do thank you that the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. And I thank you that our righteousness does not come from ourselves, but comes from you. Lord, I pray that we would be a church full of prayer, that Surfside would be a house of prayer. Lord, I pray today as we have the picnic together that your spirit would be so on each person, that each person that shows up discouraged, that each person that shows up maybe downtrodden would sense your presence and your peace in our lives. Father, I pray that would be true for our neighbors as we go home today, that that would be true for those where we shop and the things that we do, our coworkers would know your peace because we carry it with us because we've trusted in you. Lord, we need you. We don't pretend to be you. Our church doesn't pretend to have anything together except for you. And Father, as a church, we cry out that we need you. Lord, we ask as we come up on this Easter season that you would draw people to you. That people even today would show up knowing they were drawn to you. And they would come to know you for eternity. Father, thank you for this morning. Bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Every time of giving, you give what God's put on your heart this morning. Thanks for being here. So